Well, good morning, folks. You're all very welcome to our time of public worship here today. Anyone visiting with us, we give you a very warm welcome here. Before we come to worship, there's a number of announcements to be made. Evening service tonight at 7 p.m. in the hall. And if possible, could you please plan to attend that? There's no midweek meeting this week as we plan to attend the meeting to be held in Durban. That's on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. The Reverend Harry Cooper will give a talk on their evangelistic band ministry in Inniskillen and the surrounding district. And just to add on to that, if there's anyone, we hope a number of people will go. If there's anybody traveling on their own, if you want to come this way to the car park about a quarter past seven, there will be one or, one or two of us here who may have seats. So if you're on your own and you want to go with someone, come to the car park about a quarter past seven. Wednesday night is the second uh, of the walk to organic events for the Women's Fellowship. That's at 7 o'clock. Session meets on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. in the session room. The Northern Presbytery Volleyball Competition is to be held in Durban uh, on Saturday the 20th. That's the Saturday coming. Uh, 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock and that is for year eight and above. This, the Share Holiday Conference, which is running from the 10th to the 17th of August, they still have a few spaces available, and booking closes on the 29th of April. So if anyone is interested, see the poster in the church notice board for details. The RP International Conference this summer there's losing date for bookings is the 15th of May. Again, there's a poster in the vestibule with all the details. The Evangelical Conference, organized by the Mission Committee, will be held in Collibaki, RPC, on Saturday, the 11th of May, between 10.30 and 1 p.m. The speaker for that is the Reverend John would say, and the topic is sharing our faith in everyday life, and everyone's welcome to that. Kerry Golf Club are holding a big breakfast in the Golf Club on Friday the 19th of April, 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. Everyone is welcome, and donations are for Cancer Research UK. That's all the announcements. I've asked the Reverend Palos to lead us in our public worship. Thank you, Robbie, for those announcements. Uh, there's a free booklet on the uh, table today. The, it's the history of, of Drumore uh, Church. This is recently uh, recently published by Rex Rex Humphrey. I see they've got his name spelled wrong on the front the front page. Uh, I'm good at saying things other people get wrong. Not good at saying things I get wrong myself. Um, so those are those are on the table, and then also there's there's some cards in regard to senior senior camp, and just a reminder about the church camps. Uh, young uh, young folk that are going to church camps, the the congregation will pay half the cost for our young people that are going to church uh, church camps. So that that helps with the the uh, uh, affordability of that. Um, we worship. God today singing praise to him. Uh, let us turn to Psalm number 9 and we uh, sing using the tune Resignation 295 Psalm 9 and singing stanzas 5 uh, through to 
Jan. Stanza five, the Lord is a stronghold, a refuge, a tower for all the oppressed in their dark, troubled hour. And uh, the psalm continues to speak about how God hears the cry of the poor and uh, how he uh, remembers the cause of the weak and uh, how his ear is open to those who are meek. And the Lord himself is strong, but he cares for those who are weak. For those who think they are strong uh, are, are wrong, and uh, God is against those who, who think that they are strong. And um, the, uh, the psalm closes with the sentence, Strike terror within them, O Lord, always then let nations know truly that they are mere men. And uh, we, are, we are just mere men and, men and women. Uh, only God is great. And uh, the God who is great, he is, a, he is a stronghold, he is a refuge, and he is a tower unto his people. So let us uh, look to him then, singing his praise, stanzas 5 to 10, the tune is 295, we stand to sing, and remain standing then for prayer, let us all worship God.
uh, come to God in prayer. Lord God, we praise you that uh, you are the one who is described in this psalm as being a stronghold, as being a refuge, and as being a, a tower. And Lord, we are we are weak, and uh, we do not have true strength in ourselves. And we thank you that there is one who is strong, and we praise you, Lord, that you always will be strong. Uh, we thank you that you do not lose your strength. And we praise you, God, that you will bring into judgment all who think themselves strong but are not. We give thanks for this Lord's Day. We thank you for the blessing that the Lord's Day is unto uh, your people. And we pray that as we uh, see the things that you've written down in the scriptures, that we will benefit from these. We pray that you will help us, Lord, to hope in you and trust in you. And we pray that uh, today you will, you will strengthen our faith and uh, that you will refine our faith and that this, this day will be a day when uh, you will remember us in our needs and provide for us in the midst of those needs. Uh, hear our prayers now, grant forgiveness for all our sins. We pray in Jesus' name. Now let us look to God's Word, and turning to the New Testament, and uh, several readings in the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the, the Corinthians. Uh, I've been troubled with migraines in the last couple of days, and I took one this morning at 9 o'clock, so I'm, I'm, struggling, I'm struggling a wee bit, so if you think I'm a bit off form today... I, I am. Second <laughs> uh, Corinthians chapter 2, first of all, and we'll also be reading in chapter 4 and uh, in chapter 11. And uh, if anyone has any uh, migraine wisdom to offer me in the way out, please, please do so. Um, so, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 2, and the verses in this chapter we read are from verse 5, so let us hear this now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I, I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. And Paul mentions there the, the, the designs of Satan. And uh, we turn to chapter 4, beginning of chapter 4. And in these verses, uh, the work of Satan is also mentioned. Second Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, 
as shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I'm turning also to chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. At the beginning of 2 Corinthians 11, read the first four verses. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted you put up with it readily enough and in verse 12 and what I do I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work the same terms as we do for such men are false apostles deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ and no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light so it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness their end will correspond to their deeds. And we end our readings there at that verse in 2 Corinthians 11. We look to God to, to bless these readings uh, from his word. And uh, we sing to his praise now, uh, singing from Psalm 97. The tune is Warrington, number 37. Psalm 97, we sing the first uh, stanza of the psalm then we sing four through to seven, 97, first stanza, and then four to seven, June Warrington, number 37. And the fourth stanza speaks about those who worship gods that are no gods at all. All worshippers of images are put to shame. All those who boast in worthless idols, other gods, you all bow down before him must. There are worthless idols that people that people worship. And uh, but there is there is a true God. Stanza six says, You are supreme above all gods. And then it says, Who love the Lord must wrong reject. He guards the souls of all his saints. From wicked hands heal them protect. Uh, it's it's our, it's our duty to reject what's wrong, and it's God's work to guard the souls of his saints and, and protect them uh, from the hands of the wicked. So let us sing his praise then. Psalm 97, singing stanza 1 and then 4 through to 7, tune number 37. We stand as we sing God's praise. Thank you. 
I'll speak to the children. If you come up to the front room, please. Right, I'll begin with a question for you this morning. Uh, have you? I wonder, have you ever missed out on something because you were too young? That happens quite often in life. There's something that you see other people doing, but you, you don't get to do it because you're not yet old enough. Old enough to do it. Uh, that that happened to me when I was uh, when I was a child. I can uh, I can remember. I, I had an older brother and sister. And in the summertime, during the school holidays, uh, they uh, they got to go and stay with some cousins of my mother's, and they owned a they owned a little shop in a post office. And my brother and sister got to help out in the shop and, 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 and post office. And I would I would have loved to have done that, but I was I was too young uh, to be to be going uh, with them. And um, uh, with the folk that they stayed with. Um, the uh, man who was a who was a farmer and did a wee bit in the in the shop as well. Uh, he liked to play to play tricks on my brother and sister. And there was one time when they were in their they were in their bedroom and they heard they heard a knocking at the door. But when, whenever they went to the door, there was nobody there was nobody at the door. And they went back to bed, and then a wee while later the door knocked again, and they went to the, the, the door. There was nobody there. And uh, my mum's my mum's cousin, well, he was lying in his bed, and he had a piece of string in his hand, and he had a he had a boot attached to the top of the door, and he could pull the string from his bed, and the, the, the boot would kick against the would kick against the door, and, and my brother and sister thought there was somebody at the door. There wasn't anybody at the door. There, there was just a, a wee man sniggering sniggering in his bed, thinking this was really this was really funny. Uh, and uh, he, he loved to play to play different uh, tricks on my brother and sister when they when they were when they were there, and I I, I, I really wanted to be there as well, but it didn't it didn't happen uh, for uh, for me. But the, the the tricks that were played on them didn't do them any harm, and they loved to tell those uh, those stories about about what had happened to them. But the Bible warns us that there is there is someone who does want. To do us harm, and he has all sorts of ways of seeking to fool us and to trick us. And the, the Bible warns us about the, the different schemes or devices of Satan. Uh, Jesus himself, when he was in this world, he was tempted uh, by Satan, and Satan is still busy uh, trying to tempt people of all ages. To do things that are wrong, uh, to say things that are wrong, and to believe things that are wrong. And the way that the devil works is uh, that uh, the, when he's tempting us to sin, he tells us that there's there's nothing wrong with what we're being tempted to do. But he knows there is. And then after we sin, uh, he tells us that God could never forgive us for the awful thing that we have done. And that's not true either. Because there is forgiveness for people like us. Uh, there is forgiveness for sinners like ourselves. There is forgiveness uh, through the work of the Lord Jesus. But there's no forgiveness for Satan. Satan will never be forgiven. And uh, we can have something that he can't have. He doesn't want us to have forgiveness. He wants us to sin, but he doesn't want us to be forgiven. He doesn't want us doesn't want us to have what he will never have. And so Satan will try uh, to get us to do things that are wrong. And when we've done those things, he'll make those things seem to us so awful that we think, "And God could never forgive me for what I have done." But with the Lord there is forgiveness. And Jesus was punished for the awful, awful sins of many, many other people. Uh, so 
Satan wants to trick us and he wants to harm us and he wants to damage us and he doesn't want us to receive God's forgiveness and we, we need to be aware that we're not to believe him but we're to believe what the Lord says to us in his word. So beware of, of Satan's schemes. Okay. Worship God now, returning to him our tithes and our offerings. now to God in prayer and uh, among the things I intend to pray for today uh, is a minister's conference that takes place in, in, in Staffordshire in England at this time of year organised by the Banner of Truth and uh, there's about a third of the uh, RP ministers who are going across to that uh, tomorrow so in the next four days that conference will be taking place there will be over, over 300 ministers from uh, various places in, in the United Kingdom and further and further afield for, pray for that, uh, that event. Uh, we come to God now in prayer. If you're able, please stand as we pray. Lord, we praise you that uh, we are able to come to you through our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can come to you uh, whether we're, we're feeling weak or feeling strong or just feeling average, we rejoice, O Lord, that you are the God who is approachable uh, through our mediator. And Lord, we want to return thanks to you uh, for your mercies. We, we have been praying for uh, Robert in hospital. We give thanks that he got home from hospital uh, last last week. And uh, we pray for his uh, ongoing uh, recovery. We pray for uh, gaining of, of strength and we pray for wisdom for those who assess what uh, further treatment would be appropriate in his case. We give thanks also for the first of the, uh, the walk, talk and eat uh, evenings for those who, uh, who came along on Wednesday night and uh, we thank you for the, the message that was delivered in the epilogue and uh, we, we look to you Lord uh, acknowledging your, your good hand in that. We thank you also for the the conference, this, the Women's Fellowship Spring Conference, and the opportunity that ladies from many, uh, many churches had to gather together in Drumbol yesterday, and uh, we praise you for uh, such times. We give thanks also that Kenny Stevenson has completed his e exams at the Theological College, and uh, that his, his time of studies there has, has come to an end, and we thank you, Lord, for your mercies in, in bringing him through from start to finish and from susta uh, for sustaining him and uh, being able that he was able to manage to, to continue with uh, his, his work helping his father on the farm during uh, his time at the Theological College. We pray that you provide for him in the future and open up the way for him and for where you would want him to serve you. We pray, Lord, for the situation in the, uh, in the Middle East and we pray, Lord, that uh, things will not not get worse, but we pray, Lord, that there will be movement in the opposite direction, and we pray that the conflict there will not, will not spread to other other lands, and, and that you would restrain uh, those who would 
react uh, in, a, in a hot-headed way to things that are done by others. We pray, Lord, for the uh, ongoing conflict in Ukraine. We pray, O oh God, for your mercies in the midst of all of that. And we pray for uh, Christians who, who aren't living in places where there is conflict, but who are living in, in lands where there's much persecution and uh, where their faith is, is despised. And we pray for your strengthening for them. Uh, we, we pray for the, the gathering of, of ministers and missionaries in, uh, in Staffordshire uh, over the next few days. And we pray that, uh, that those who gather there will benefit from the, the talks that they hear and for the, from their time together. And we pray that it will be a, a, a benefit uh, to uh, people in their, in, their, in their work in churches and, and on mission fields. We uh, pray, Lord, for this Wednesday evening for the, the second of the Walk, Talk and Eat evenings. We pray that the, uh, that it, it will be, uh, the weather would be suitable for, uh, for those who would want to walk. And uh, we pray for all of Collins and the, and the message that she delivers. We pray that uh, we'll really benefit from what she would be able to say. We pray also for the meeting of session on Thursday night. And we pray for uh, the meeting in Rathfreyland where the call to Peter Dundee is presented. And uh, we pray for the folk from Craig Fergus and those from Clare who will be speaking. And we pray for Peter that you will lead him uh, in, in that decision that uh, he needs to make. We give thanks for the plans being made for the church camps, for boys and girls, uh, discovery and adventure camps, and for the senior camp. And uh, Lord, we pray that there'll be many young folk who uh, will be able to go to these camps and really benefit um, uh, from their time to get together and uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy that experience. Uh, we look to you, Lord, and ask for your help for uh, Ross and his, and his work in South Africa. Pray for him these two weeks when he's on land and uh, in the work uh, among children and Bible clubs and youth clubs. And we pray that he'll be able to do a good job in that. Uh, we look to you, Lord, and ask for your mercies in, the, uh, in, our, in our weather. We pray that you will uh, soon send a time of, of uh, dry weather after all the rain that we've had, we pray that there will be there will be conditions suitable for the uh, the, the sowing of, of crops. Lord, we, we look to you in your in your mercy. Uh, we, you, you have uh, brought us to not take these things for granted. But, oh Lord, we do look to you as, as the one who controls these things, and we pray for your mercy and your provision uh, in this matter. Lord, hear our prayers, and we pray that you will. Help us to see your truth in, in the scriptures and, and be alert to the things that we need to be alert to. We pray all now in Jesus' name. Amen. turn now to God's Word, and I want to speak on uh, some of the things in the verses we read earlier in the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and uh, among the things I'm going to be speaking about uh, is something that was one of the themes in our uh, devotional our devotional readings over the past week, uh, where, where, where we've been reminded of the, the, the necessity that those who have received forgiveness would also grant forgiveness. Um, I want you to picture yourself at home and the doorbell rings and uh, as you as you go to the door you, you see a uh, you see a figure there someone someone you don't recognize and uh, it's a man who, who, who seems to be wearing some kind of uniform there's there's some kind of jacket with a company what looks like a company logo. He seems to have some sort of identity card hanging around his neck. And as he starts into his spiel, you're not quite sure who he is or why uh, he's there. You're wondering, is he, is he looking for you to sign up 
uh, for a direct debit payment to some charity? Uh, or is he doing some market research? Uh, or is he trying to get you to switch from one electricity supplier uh, to another? You're also wondering, is he genuine? Uh, or is this a scam of some sort that has now come to your door? Uh, there are so many stories that we hear about uh, people who become the victims of one kind of fraudster uh, or another that we might almost be tempted to presume that somebody that comes uh, to our door isn't isn't genuine and that that's that is the approach that some people do actually uh, ad ad adopt now that that alertness that uh, we we do need to maintain to some extent is something that the Bible teaches us uh, we also need to have because of a spiritual enemy. A spiritual enemy who is always out to deceive us. The Lord Jesus, when he was in this world, was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. The Gospels tell us about the, the three uh, temptations, three different ways in which temptation came to the Lord Jesus. And uh, today I want to speak um, based on some words in 2 Corinthians. And in that book, I want to point you to three different places in which we are alerted to Satan's schemes, to Satan's devices. And those devices of Satan are directed uh, against unbelievers but they're also directed against against people who are worshippers of God, and they're directed against people who are true worshippers of God. And uh, I want to note what Paul alerts us to in Second Corinthians regarding what Satan will seek to do. Uh, none of us are off limits uh, to the schemes of Satan. There are three of them that I want to speak of. Uh, first, the first one that I want to refer to is found in Second Corinthians chapter four, and uh, this is this this is found in particular in, in verses three and four. And there it says, "And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case." God of this world, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And uh, Satan's first device is that of blinding. Satan blinds the minds of unbelievers. That's what it says to us uh, in verse 4. In ordinary life, there are things that one person might really appreciate uh, and, and might really enthuse over and rave about, whereas another person will not see anything special at all in those things things. Uh, take, for example, an art gallery. Uh, there, there are people who could stand and admire one painting in an art gallery uh, for longer than I would want to spend in the entire art gallery, taking a quick whiz through, looking left and right, and, and getting out as soon as possible. I have never developed uh, an eye or an appetite for art, I, I am I am blind to whatever it is people people see as utterly uh, fascinating. And as it is in ordinary life, so it is with the gospel. Satan is able to blind the minds of people so that they cannot see the beauty and the power and the hope and the comfort, and the value, and the relevance, and the sense, and the excellence 
of the gospel. They just don't see it. It doesn't appeal to them at all. It doesn't attract them in any way. They are blinded to the glory of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan blinds the minds of unbelievers. And perhaps, perhaps that is you. Maybe that's your story. And perhaps it's the case that you know other people. And for them, the whole message about Jesus and his salvation is something that means everything to them. And they just don't seem to be able to get enough of it. But for you, it it has never been like that. You're always like me in the art gallery. You're, You're just ready to move on and get to something that's much more interesting instead. Perhaps your eyes have been blinded by Satan and you have never seen the excellence of salvation in Jesus Christ. But perhaps there's someone and you you know that that is true. And in the past that never bothered you in the slightest. But now it does. And now you realize that the gospel actually is something that really matters. And yet you know that you've never had an appetite for it. Well, if that's you, then you need to pray to the Lord. And you need to ask him to take away your blindness. Take away your blindness so that you can see what you know that other people have already seen. And the good news is that the Lord Jesus is stronger than Satan. And just as Jesus, when he was in this world, was able to open the eyes of those who were physically blind, nobody else could help them. So now Jesus is able to take away spiritual blindness. And Satan can blind us to the gospel. But Jesus can open our eyes to the gospel. And he can do that so that you could see what other people have already seen and found so wonderful. And your spiritual blindness is no harder to cure than the spiritual blindness that other people have already been cured of. And so what you need to do is to ask the Lord whom you can't see to open your eyes so that you will see what you have never seen before. Uh, That's not what Satan wants. He wants to keep you in the dark. There is something that he does not want you to see. Satan blinds the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Satan's schemes, he he blinds. But he has many schemes. And uh, another one that I want to refer to that's found in 2 Corinthians 11 is that of deceiving. Uh, This is mentioned by Paul in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. He is expressing his concern that uh, false teachers would deceive the Corinthian believers into into believing something that is different from the true gospel. Uh, Verse uh, 3, he says, I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And verses 13 and 14, he refers to these false teachers and he says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And if Satan is not able to stop a person from believing, in some sense, believing in Christ, then the next best thing for him to do 
is to get the person to believe the wrong things about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the end result is that it's not the real Jesus that people believe in. And people can label themselves as being Christians, but it's not the Christ of the Scriptures that they're trusting in and following. And many of you will have encountered, uh, to some extent, people who are like that. Uh, with, with some people, the thing that hinders them from truly being saved is their religion. It's the things they believe that keep them from truly believing. Uh, take, for example, the person who claims to be a Christian, but who doesn't believe in hell. And they, they say that the Jesus they believe in would never send anyone to hell. And they would probably say that he's far too loving to do something like that. Well, of, of course, they're right uh, to some extent. Because the Jesus they want to believe in, he wouldn't ever send anyone to hell. But he's not the real Jesus. He's not the Jesus of the scriptures. who warn more than anyone else uh, about the reality of hell. And we all need to be careful that our ideas about Jesus actually come from the word of God and not from some other source. And that was Paul's great concern for the Corinthians. There were people coming in and they were, they were teaching a different Jesus and a different gospel. And it wasn't the real thing. And Paul saw it as a, a huge issue. And they, the Corinthians, they needed to resist the false apostles teaching a, a different kind of Jesus and a different way of salvation. And uh, in, in, our, in our time, there are all sorts of corruptions of the true Christian faith that are, are spread about. And we all need to have godly discernment to see what is false and to appreciate what is true. Uh, the, the Lord Jesus came into this world to save sinners. He didn't come into this world to redefine sin. And what was viewed by the apostles and the prophets as being sin, it is still sin. And all of us are sinful from the very moment of our conception. It, it is in our DNA, as it were. And only if God, in his grace, grants us saving faith in the Lord Jesus, who is our sin-bearer, who is our substitute, only then can our sin by take, be taken away. And only if our sin is taken away from us will we escape being condemned by the Lord Jesus, who will be the judge of all the earth. And anyone who pins their hopes on a, a Jesus that is different from the Jesus of the Bible uh, will be told to depart from me. I never knew you. Satan is a deceiver. He wants to deceive us uh, that we will take hold of something that isn't the truth and think that it is need to be aware of Satan's endless schemes of trying to trick people into believing in a false Jesus. That's what the cults are all about. They talk happily about Jesus, but their Jesus is not the Jesus of the scriptures. It's a false Jesus, it's a false gospel, and it leads you to a real true hell. And in some ways, uh, this is all even more dangerous than unbelief is. Because unbelievers know they're unbelievers. Unbelievers know that they don't care about these things. But false believers, false believers think they're the real thing. And that's the thing that keeps them from being the real thing. Uh, Satan loves to 
to see. Uh, so these are these are two two of the schemes of Satan. He blames the minds of unbelievers, and he seeks to deceive those who want to believe, so that they believe what is false. The third uh, scheme of Satan that I want to speak of is that of dividing. Uh, Satan doesn't leave alone those who do believe in the real Jesus, who do believe the real gospel. And Satan sees true Christians as his enemies. He sees true Christians as a threat to his territory. And he knows that true Christians have something that he will never have. And Satan understands that it's often through the witness uh, of Christians that other people become Christians. And so he, he strives hard to spoil the witness of those who are Christians. And he does that in a variety of ways. For example, he will, he will, he will try to make us afraid to speak. He will put a fear into us that we don't want to open our mouths and, and say anything. And best keep quiet. Uh, or he, he'll make us think, well, well, nobody would be interested in what you have to say. Um, so you, you'd better say nothing. But what, what we find in Second Corinthians chapter 2 is, is a different line of attack. And we're told there in those verses about a man within the church who had caused grief uh, within the church and his case had been dealt with there was some form of uh, discipline that was administered uh, verse 6 of chapter 2 uh, refers to the, the punishment by the majority as having been enough and now with that having been done Paul calls upon uh, the members of the church to forgive and to comfort the person who has repented of their sin. Here's a man who has done wrong, but he has acknowledged that he has done wrong, and he has turned from his wrongdoing. He has corrected his ways, he has changed his ways, he's going in a different direction. And Paul uh, says that forgiveness needs to be extended to such a person and uh, he says verses 10 and 11 anyone whom you forgive I also forgive indeed what I have forgiven if I have forgiven anything has been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan for we are not ignorant of his designs and it is Satan's tactic to ensure that there's, there's no forgiveness granted to repentant sinners and we are called upon to be like God God forgives those who repent of their sin and we are to follow him he stands ready to forgive and we are to stand ready to forgive also and we are to be looking for that repentance that enables us to grant forgiveness and for this man who, who had sinned grievously uh, the, the, the punishment uh, was now in the past and Paul urges his readers to, to move on now to their new duty. Verse 8 he says, I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Uh, and this was hugely important for the, uh, for the witness and the unity and the fellowship of the church. Uh, repentant sinners uh, need to be forgiven, need to be uh, loved, and uh, need to be made to feel that they belong among the people of God. And in Corinth, there was to be no spirit of bitterness. There was to be no holding on to, to old hurts and old grievances. And there was to be no unforgiving spirit. If we're Christians, then we are so thankful that, that, that God has forgiven us of our sin. And we are to stand ready to forgive.
forgive uh, when uh, when people have repented of their sin. And uh, so if, if you know yourself that you are a great sinner, and if you know that God has forgiven you all of that sin of yours, if, if you know that instead of you paying the price, that Jesus has paid the price, and for you there's no condemnation, well, well that is that is a relief like no other. That is a weight off your mind like no other weight off your mind. That is a wonderful thing. And it is a wonderful thing also when we are able to extend forgiveness to others. When someone truly forgives you, that is a great blessing. And Satan seeks to prevent that ever really happening among God's people. And we're alerted here uh, in Second Corinthians 2 uh, so, that, so that we'll not be ignorant of his schemes or his devices. Satan loves to keep people divided whereas the Lord delights in bringing about reconciliation. So think about these schemes Satan. Has the Lord actually taken away your blindness to the gospel? Have you ever seen the Lord Jesus Christ as being exactly the saviour that you need and, and, and seen Christian salvation as, as the most wonderful thing there is? Has your blindness been taken away? Praise the Lord if it has. And do you believe in the real Jesus? Do you believe in the real Jesus of the Bible? Not some 21st century reconstructed, modernized Jesus. But if you believe in the real Jesus, praise God that it is the real Jesus you believe in. And is there anyone, is there anyone to whom you have the duty of forgiveness and of reaffirming love towards that Satan would want to keep you from all of these things. Uh, let us seek to do what God would lay upon our hearts. It, it is a great blessing to others to receive our forgiveness. But it's a great blessing to us to be able to extend forgiveness also. And it will be a great blow to Satan when he sees God's people extending forgiveness to one another. Because we will be receiving and we will be giving something that he will never receive. Satan will never be forgiven. There is no possibility of salvation for Satan and for the angels who fell with him. But there is salvation for sinful human beings Repent and believe. Satan wants us to think that there is no hell for unrepentant sinners, but he knows that there is. And Satan himself will never be forgiven. But by God's grace, we can be forgiven. And by God's grace, we can be those who forgive others. And that which we have received, that we are able to extend unto others. So let us be alert to the schemes of Satan. He loves to blind people's minds so that the, the, the gospel is just such an uninteresting and useless and irrelevant thing. Now he, he longs to deceive people so that they think they're Christians and they think they're believing in Jesus, but it's just their own version of Jesus. It's not the real person. And he loves to keep hostility on the boy so that no one is willing to forgive. No one is willing to reaffirm love because of what someone else has done that will always be held against them. Well, that is not God's way. And God will not hold against us what he has and uh, we, we are not to 
give in easily to the schemes and devices of Satan. We're to be alert to them. And we're, we're to know that he will come after us. He'll try to get us one way or another. If he, if he can't keep you from believing in spiritual things, he'll get you to believe the wrong spiritual things. And if he can't stop you from believing the right spiritual things, he'll try to stop you from being the right kind of person you should be as a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are to be alert to the many schemes of Satan. And God can give us that alertness. The Lord Jesus Christ is stronger than Satan. Satan is devious and subtle, uh, but Christ is stronger. And he is able to, 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 uh, to lead us in, in all of these things and to see things as they really are and to enable us to believe in him, the real him, and to honor him in the way we live. Beware of the schemes of Satan. We sing uh, in praise to God, and uh, the psalm we sing is 96, the A version. We sing the first five stanzas, and also the last stanza, number 10, 96A, singing 1 to 5, and also stanza 10, the tune is Blind Word, number 255. False gods are mentioned in stanza three. For all people's gods are idols, but the Lord the heavens made splendor, majesty, and strength, beauty in his house displayed. And uh, in the last stanza we sing of the one who is the judge. For he comes to sit in judgment of the earth, and judge will he all the world in righteousness, and all its Faithfully. And, uh, the Jesus of the Bible is the Jesus who is the judge of all the earth, and he will, he will always be right in his judgment. And we need to be sure we are on the right side of that judgment, uh, that we truly believe in him and trust, uh, trust in him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Psalm 96a, we sing the first five stanzas, and the last stanza of the tune is 255. We stand to sing, standing then for the benediction.
receive God's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.